Welcome and thank you for joining us in the session The Health Workforce, Role of Expert Patients, Community Pharmacists and Community Resilience, moderated by Orajit Bumrams Kulzwat, Assistant Secretary General at the Heart to Heart Foundation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, is, uh, <clears throat> this session is about Role of Expert Patients, community pharmacists and community resilience. It's a good opportunity to talk about the health workforce and a role of exploitation. At our GPC 2020 in September, the CEO of the International Pharmaceutical Federation and the president of the Community Pharmacists Association India both share with us the role of the community pharmacists in ensuring patient safety and resilience of their community during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19, they were placed at considerable risk while serving patients who are chilling. And many patient organizations have carried out their own COVID-19 response surveys. The role of their expert patient in supporting the local and national COVID-19 pandemic control efforts is now well appreciated. If the community pharmacists are considered the fourth emergency service, then expert patients must be the fifth emergency service during pandemics, especially in the rare disease ecosystem. This session wants to raise the profile of expert patients and community pharmacists as an additional health workers resource that can be tapped into the support community resilience. We have three speakers in this session. And may I introduce, first is Mrs. Manjuri Karas, the Vice President of International Pharmaceutical Federation. Her main areas of works are pharmacy education, community a pharmacy and consumer medicine education. And she also advocates for larger role of practicing pharmacists in healthcare. She got two global awards. One is follow, Fellow of International Pharmaceutical Federation India 2016. And another one is Award of Federation of Asian Pharmaceutical Association, India 2018. And also received, she's a recipient of the fellowship of IPA and several other awards from social and professional organization in the country. The second speaker is Ms. Bru Echivari. Hi, <laughs> she is currently Regional Director of the Global Nonprofit Organization, the Lymphoma Coalition. She has 25 years of executive and government, uh, governance experience in a range of organizations in the healthcare sector. And as previously CEO of the Leukemia and Blood Center, New Zealand, she grew the organization to a prominent NGO developing national service and sustainable income streams generating 50 million US dollar prior to working in the NGO sector. Lou has a corporate career in the multinational healthcare industry. And she works to strategically build capacity for patient organization. She has a passionate interest inducing credible evidence-based data as a powerful way for patient input to be, well, to be valued, both in decision-making and improving outcomes. One more speaker is Dr. Ritu Jain. She is the president of the Asia Pacific Alliance of Rare Disease Organization, or APADO. The voice of the rare disease organization in the Asia Pacific region. She is also founder and current 
president of Dystopic Epidemolysis Bulosa Research Association, which is very important in Thailand also this disease is talking about in Singapore. The Epidemolysis Bulosa or EP, Patient Advocacy and Support Organization, and on the Council of Advocacy Organizations such as Rare Disease International and the International Rare Disease Research. In her various role, Little remains committed to strengthening and extending the rare disease network in the Asian regions and ensuring that rare diseases remain a priority in the national healthcare plans. So now may I introduce the first, first speaker, Mrs. Manjiri, can I pass over to you, please. Thank you, thank you, Arajit. Thank you for this kind introduction. And I bring uh, warm greetings, I extend my warm greetings on behalf of International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP, and Indian Pharmaceutical Association. It's my honor and uh, it's my pleasure to speak in this Congress of the Second Asia Pacific Patients Congress. The entire existence of the pharmacy profession or pharmacist and pharmacy professionals is only for the patients. And I'm so happy to speak in this Congress where we are talking uh, of with, where, there, where there are so many patient organizations and we are talking on behalf or for the patients. I would like to uh, start my presentation and I'm just sharing the slides. Yes, thank you. So I would like to uh, talk about the community pharmacists. Let me just make clear to everyone, the community pharmacist means the pharmacist in the retail pharmacy shops. In still this part of the region like India or Southeast Asia, we call them retail chemist or chemist and druggist and the medical shops and so on. The world over, uh, we are calling them the community pharmacists. So I'll be talking about this health workforce, which has remained untapped, un, uh, which has remained untapped potential so far. So the outline of the presentation, I would like to speak about the COVID-19 pandemic and the role played by the pharmacists. Uh, thanks, Orajit, for introducing the pharmacist as the fourth uh, emergency services and uh, so taking building on this role that was uh, that has been played by the pharmacists during this pandemic we would like to talk about the strengthening of health system involving the pharmacist and I would also talk about the role of patient organizations and consumers uh, I would also touch upon the expanded scope of practice of the pharmacist pharmacist as the caregiver and not just as a medicine seller globally and what is the situation in our part of the world? So as rightly said, pharmacists have been giving, have been extending the services during COVID-19. During early phase of the pandemic, when everything was closed, the hospitals were closed, the OPDs were not working, and only the public sector uh, health facilities were on, the only healthcare setting open for all days and for long hours was the community pharmacists. So they have really played an important role during this pandemic. They have ensured the access to the medicines and the personal protective equipment, like the mask and the hand sanitizers and so on. Uh, they have even delivered the medicines to patients' home. So there were times that we, the pharmacist or the staff had to go to the patient's home to deliver the medicines, especially in the areas where there were many COVID patients and there were restrictions. So pharmacists have left their pharmacy even in spite of many challenges that they faced. There were problem of the shortage of stock, supplies were not uh, continuous and they had to run around to maintain the stock and they also managed to, pay, to deliver the medicines to patients home. Uh, they have provided the advice to the community. Patients have been, you know, patients were coming all the time to the pharmacy asking for some sleeping pills because the mindset was disturbed because of the pandemic, or they were coming for asking for HCQ, hydroxychloroquine, in this initial part of this pandemic phase. And pharmacists had to advise the community, they had to give the right advice, even for the patients with the uh, fever or cough, so COVID-like symptoms, they were directing or they are, they have been still doing that, of course, uh, for the screening. 
in some parts of the world, especially in the developed uh, nations, pharmacists are even participating in the screening strategies. They're part of the screening uh, for COVID-19 and they're doing the point of care test that is the antigen point of care test. And now the pharmacists are taking forward, uh, they're putting a step ahead and at least in 36 countries, pharmacists are already involved in vaccination, like flu vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine. And now the pharmacists are getting ready to administer the COVID vaccine. And in India too, we have written to the government of India to utilize this health workforce and engage them in vaccine administration. So pharmacists have really served as a fourth emergency service after police, police fire and ambulance. And uh, they have risen to the challenges and they have fulfilled the expectations and the public and the society have realized their importance than ever before. Uh, as I said, I'll touch upon the globally changing pharmacy practice and uh, there is a shift, focus has shifted from the product to the person. What I mean here, the product is the medicines. So we are not just talking about the medicines or we are not just selling the medicines, but it has shifted to the person, rather the patient or the person. And so there is a transformation in many nations. You can see the pharmacy practice has transformed and the pharmacists are not just the medicine sellers. They're not just the drug dispensers, but they are caregivers. Now why community pharmacy has so much of responsibility or they are playing such an important central role in the modern healthcare? Because everybody, everybody will agree that people with symptoms, when we are not well, first thing that we do is go to the chemist shop, to the pharmacy, then visiting the doctor, then spending time and money uh, for the doctor's fees. So first set up setting where we go is the pharmacy and ask for some OTC medicines or ask for the medicine. Uh, or advice. So pharmacists are at the forefront. They are the front liners and they're the first point of contact with people with symptoms and and last point of contact when they go to the doctor and they receive the medications. So before they go home, they go to the pharmacy. So this is a very strategic position of the community pharmacies. And this is an important reason why community pharmacists have expanded their uh, role in the modern healthcare. If we look at the medicine consumption in the society, the WHO says globally, there are more than half of all medicines are prescribed, dispensed or sold inappropriately. And look at this, half of all patients fail to take them correctly. And so whose role is it? It is the pharmacist who can increase, who can improve the medicine usage by the community and help in responsible use of medicines. So world over, uh, this slide like describes the role of the pharmacist played around the medicines or health promotional activities. So they are in compounding medicines, dispensing, collecting expired medicines, health promotional activities, smoking cessation activities, harm reduction services like opioid substitution or syringe exchange programs, uh, management of anticoagulants, diabetes management. Pharmacists have a big role to play and they have been contributing to control uh, prevent NCDs and to improve the medication adherence of the patients who are on a, who are in NCDs. Asthma management, hypertension management, medication use reviews, home care services, adjusting the prescribed treatment. So more than 50 countries, we see these type of services on. So this is really a, an expanded scope of practice for the pharmacists. And I feel very proud to see that type of role, that type of uh, significant contribution that the pharmacists have in public health. Now coming to this part of the world, Southeast Asia or the Asian countries, and in some parts of uh, the Latin America, we see that the pharmacists have remained, and of course in Africa, uh, pharmacists have remained underutilized. There is need to transform their role from medicine seller role. Pharmacists are actually the valuable health workforce whose potential has remained untapped in this part of the world. Of course, there are many issues contributing to this status of the pharmacy. There is a pharmacy education, which needs to be reoriented. More of training is involved. Policies, uh, supportive policies are needed. Law enforcement has to be strict. Consumer organ sensitization has to be done that these pharmacists can educate you about your medicines. They can give you health promotional advice. Health literacy is low in our part of the world. And therefore, the pharmacists have remained unutilized, untapped potential, as well as these issues make it more complicated because of uh, 
situation. So now uh, it is a request to the patient organizations and how patient organizations and the patients or consumers can help in improving the community pharmacy practice and making it more patient oriented and making more contribution of trying to get more contribution from this health workforce in improving the public health. So just few points, there are many points, but I have just listed the few points. One basic thing is that as a patient, as a consumer organization, as a patient organization, we have to be very alert, we have to be demanding and we have to be persistent for our rights. And so we should always demand for the strict law implementation. Just an example, that in many uh, pharmacies, you won't find a registered pharmacist, but there will be an there will be an untrained staff dispensing the medicines, which can lead to so many medication errors and can cause harm to the patients. Patients say presence of the registered pharmacist in each pharmacy for all the open hours of the pharmacy. There is more need to sensitize the consumers and patients for the patient care role of the pharmacist. So then the expectations will increase, but they uh, will be enhanced. Uh, expect requests as as well uh, demand uh, and demand for the proper bills, advice on medications, blood pressure, blood glucose measurements can be done in pharmacies where it's not yet happening. Health literature, health promotional activities. So we can expect more from the pharmacies and that can help to uh, shape their new role. Um, and also we can appreciate and support the pharmacists who are trying to implement the patient care services. I see huge potential for the pharmacist role. And uh, uh, this is, an, as I again said, the untapped health workforce. Aging population is there, increasing non-communicable diseases, polypharmacy, irresponsible use of medicines. All this situation definitely demands that the pharmacists take more active role in the patient's health. And pharmacists can make the difference in the lives of people and strengthen the health system. So. Uh, the pharmacists, community pharmacists in some parts of the world have gone way beyond and they're really call, having significant contribution in the patient care. In some parts of the world, a pharmacy practice is, is lagging behind. The role of pharmacists needs to be expanded. And as a patient, as a patient organization, we can definitely you, uh, support that and can help improve the role of the pharmacist. So pharmacists are oh. true partner in your health. And uh, this is what I wanted to convey. And thank you again for this invitation. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Over to you, Arajit. And I'll be happy to take any questions later on. Yeah. Thank you, Manjari. Oh, it's very interesting, uh, the community pharmacist. I think I have some questions, but maybe later, uh, after another two speakers. Uh, next to you, Blue. Uh, can I over to you, Blue, please? Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and bring my slides up. Oops. So um, thank you so much to the organisers for this opportunity. It's a wonderful meeting to be speaking at and participating in. The Lymphoma Coalition was formed, that's who I'm here representing, was formed in 2002. And um, we're made up of 83 member organizations, patient organizations, predominantly blood cancer patient organizations, large and small. We have 83 members across the world. And we work by building and strengthening those organizations, building capacity through building credible data globally that the organizations can use locally. And we understand about evidence-based meaning that groups need credible information, it needs to be analyzed, and it needs to be in a form that can be used and taken action with. So why do we need expert patients? Well, we know that better informed patients have better outcomes. They have less difficulty with their treatment, they have better management of their side effects. They're more confident to ask questions and it even leads to lower rate of emergency hospital admissions. So they inform policymakers to make better decisions. And most importantly, and very importantly, they need to become a valued member of bringing forward what patients need to be, how patients need to be heard. 
remembering patient organizations, sometimes they're led by or fully staffed by or volunteer staff um, of patients themselves. And they are so close to what patients really need. So they need to be an essential bridge between patients, systems, doctors. So how do we develop expert patients? And it's really by harnessing data. And one of the ways that we do this um, with Lymphoma Coalition is through our reports. And I've listed or have images of several reports there, um, but just really wanted to talk about one of those in detail. And it's the uh, Global Patient Survey. And you can see from the numbers there how many people are taking part in that survey. We do it every two years. And the last time we did it was earlier in this year, just really before the pandemic um, struck globally. And we compile this data and then help our patient organizations to be able to use it. I think it's important to note that this type of information is often unreported. Um, it's powerful psychosocial data about barriers to care and what patients are really, really concerned about. We have Asia specific, Asia Pacific specific reports here and they can be used in all sorts of ways. And I wanted to use um, a, an example of one of our member groups in China who are called House 086, and they are a lymphoma patient group. They have 80,000 online members, and they have used this data incredibly powerfully. I'm talking pre-COVID times. They've used this data very powerfully they, they had done their own surveys and reports in country, living reports of what patients' experiences were inside China. But once they had this data, they could actually compare those experiences with other patients in Asia and other patients across the world. They took this data, they shared it with their doctors, they shared it with their policy makers, and they shared it with government. And things started to change. They were subsequently invited by government in China to come and present some of these findings. Clinicians were asking them to present this information. And in some instances, it led to some subtypes of lymphoma being listed as rare diseases, which they are, and being able to see medicines fast-tracked to fund those. So it's powerful data. But this is credible data, and it's important to have that, part, that type of data to be seen as a credible part of the system. And this played out really strongly when COVID-19 struck and health systems started to fail or they simply couldn't keep up with demand, but they very certainly couldn't keep up with the need to communicate with patients and how they could communicate with patients. And that's where expert patients bridge the gap. And you, uh, I've explained pathways to becoming expert patients and patient organizations. But it's really, really, very, really important. We see yawning gaps between systems understanding the needs and you know, what patient organizations can bring to that. And they jumped in at the time of um, COVID-19 striking and did become emergency organizations. And in a lot of countries, they were treated as that. In, in part of the health system, they were treated as emergency organizations. And the needs, whilst um, they were absolutely related to their organizations, became as basic as hand sanitizer and food and masks and money and channels for medicines access as well. And they acted as a very, very strong informational bridge and patient organizations are a trusted link. Patients do trust the information they're getting from those organizations. But we saw with how the organization in China had become a trusted organization, they became an incredibly important part of the health ecosystem in China when this uh, COVID-19 struck. And remembering they had no playbook. They were the, the first country experiencing COVID-19 and they certainly had no playbook for what was going to what was going to unfold or what was going to happen but they did know from using the patient experience data that they already had they did know that patients would urgently need accurate timely information and psychosocial support so this group house 086 were incredibly active setting up 
um, new groups on WeChat and webinars every several days and information on their website. Expert physicians used this group to communicate with their patients and communicate quite quickly with their patients. This group acted as the conduit between hospitals where patients simply couldn't, and this is across the world, not just in China, but where patients couldn't access data, couldn't find out what was being offered by the hospital, what was gonna to happen to their treatment. They were able to be the conduit between the hospital information and patients asking what they needed. It, it was incredibly important stuff. And, and coming back onto the slide, patient groups and patients are at the coalface every day. They know what is needed and health systems and big systems and bureaucracies don't. Patient organizations can move really quickly. Even quite large organizations can move really quickly and they have fabulous platforms to communicate from and quickly with their databases that they can contact patients and caregivers, websites and social media channels. And I mentioned the group in China has a channel with 80,000 members on it. The patient groups quickly move their information online, very quickly move their meetings online, and they could organize specialist briefings for, for hospitals, for specialists, and acted again as that hub. And we all know that some of the biggest issues and ongoing that patients and communities face was isolation. And patient organizations play a really, really important part in connecting people and having somewhere to check in, which absolutely has a role to play in easing fear and, and anxiety. There's also great collaboration between um, patient organizations and other groups. And that just amplifies reach and amplifies the resource. So the other thing that this organization did um, just by way of example, they shared all of that information and what they did. They shared their playbook with our other groups. So the Lymphoma Coalition put that information of how this group had best used their data and they put that online. So there was, they were able to mount their response from that. I've talked about the um, surveys that Lymphoma Coalition has done. But we know from talking to our patient groups that each and every one of them also were surveying. They were surveying so they knew at all times what their patients and carers were worried about, what they needed, and they, were, they kept doing that. So all of our patient organizations reported they themselves were doing their own surveys. They might have been very quick and simple surveys in some cases or more extensive. This slide is about another survey that we call the Coalition of Coalitions. And Lymphoma Coalition grouped up with four other global cancer coalitions and surveyed all the members all together. And there was 157, this was in May this year, 157 organizations took part in that survey. The purpose of that was for us to understand what the patient groups themselves needed to strengthen, to pass on and help patients and how we could actually help them and best support them. And obviously no surprise with some of the things that were found from that survey, and it was quite extensive, but actually in Asia Pacific, just to put forward a couple of uh, notable pieces, of course, funding was an issue for all groups and suddenly funding was drying up. 80% of the groups in Asia Pacific redu had reduced funding and on average by up to 50%. And this was at the very time they needed to be there more for patients with increased demand. They needed to invest in technology to take services online and their staff themselves were under pressure. The group's main um, concerns for their patients were, were playing the role that would ensure good quality patient care didn't stop. And they worried about their lack of direct contact with patients and their ability to return to normal. In Asia Pacific, it was noted more than other regions, all regions noted fear and anxiety, but it was considerably higher in the patient organizations and reported from the patients in Asia Pacific. 
and treatment concerns were the most common overall. All organisations adjusted their service to address patient need. So I think we talk about building back better and um, some people want to go back to what we had. And I hope we don't really in terms of the role that patient groups play. We always are advocating around access and it's not just access to treatment. Um, that doesn't go away. We're still going to need to do that. But now we're going to need to advocate around delayed diagnoses and diagnosis with later stages of disease, in our case, cancer, interrupted treatment. We saw clinical trial issues and how things needed to change very, very quickly. And they did with regulators, with industry. Let's keep some of that. Treatment got decentralized to improve access. That helped rural patients and patients that have trouble um, accessing main centers and patient organizations were at the hub of that. Data I've talked about, but it is an essential part of the process. And to the pharmaceutical industry, I thank you. And please do keep supporting the groups you're involved with. It's essential that you do that. And involve patients all the way. We've heard from other talks in this meeting about clinical trial design and having patients involved. But it's also understanding the many, many barriers that they face. I'm only going to touch on the co a comment or two about vaccines. But going forward, patient organisations are going to play a very, very key role with this, informing patients and being, again, that conduit of information. Who, who are they safe for? Who should have access? And playing that role between, between um, systems, let's say, and patients. And we're only all going to achieve that through partnering and collaboration. So thank you. Thank you, Bro. Very interesting. I think uh, your, your knowledge and your experience is uh, quite similar to Thailand also and uh, useful. I think maybe later we can have some network for, uh, from, from your report also. I think it should be some Thai, <laughs> Thai report. Fantastic. Uh, the next one is uh, Dr. Ritu. Yeah, you also very interesting. Sorry about rare disease. And uh, Thailand now we also uh, interest in the rare disease uh, put into the universal health coverage. We are working uh -huh. on that. And I think uh, your uh, experience may be quite useful for Thailand as well, because I also in the rare disease committee right now to develop in the universal health coverage. Maybe I will uh, contact you sometime later. Uh, so over to you, please, Dr. Ritu. Thank you, Rajit. I would be delighted to have a discussion with you uh, going forward on universal health coverage. And yes, uh, at APADO, this is a very central area of uh, focus and work. So thanks everyone for having me here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this and for allowing me to bring the voice of rare disease patients and organizations across the Asia Pacific to you today. I am, am here not just as the president of the Asia Pacific Alliance of Rare Disease Organizations, APADO, but also as a mother of a girl with EB, epidermolysis bullosa, and um, so not just as a patient advocate, but also as a parent. And uh, another layer or aspect of my work is also as a sociolinguist and an educator in one of our universities. So while um, Pru, you, your presentation was absolutely fabulous. Um, you gave these insights from organize, patient organizations that are so parallel to what uh, we have seen among rare disease organizations. And what Manjuri shared also as a stopgap uh, uh, pillars of healthcare support, the pharmacists, this is uh, another element that we are finding resonates in our own experience and um, survey and study insights. So COVID-19 has really thrown um, into stark awareness, into stark light, 
the challenges of rare disease uh, patients and organizations. And uh, I'm amazed at how much society, regardless of our um, of our uh, areas of focus, be it pharmacists or um, rare cancers, or even my role as an educator, I'm finding in all my roles, there are certain areas of overlap. So I hope I can, um, spontaneously share with you some of my experiences and insights gained uh, from this phase of COVID-19, uh, which is almost now 10 months of the year. So who has been impacted by C19? In my experience, it is primarily, of course, patients, patient organizations, and uh, caregivers. So I, um, we, we at uh, Apado, conducted a survey earlier in the year, very much early in the phase of COVID-19 around, around April, and we collected some data from about 80 organizations from 10 countries in the Asia Pacific. And uh, this data is strictly from patient organizations, not from patients, because that's what we support organizations. And um, I was startled to see how what I was experiencing as the president of DEBRA, the single uh, condition support organization, um, the experiences of patients and the organization Debra as, as an entity was parallel to what I was seeing in terms of the data that our study was revealing. So um, I find that uh, patients and caregivers are significantly impacted where, for example, in Pakistan, where I support patients with EB, through trying to establish a DEBRA, a DEBRA group in Pakistan, I find that uh, many patients were extremely distressed, most patients in fact, that doctors are no longer available in the hospitals because they are so afraid of uh, their own safety and the safety of their families that they don't frequent the hospitals anymore. So C19 um, exacerbated enhance the challenges. In fact, I would call it uh, twice marginalization. Once they're marginalized by their rare conditions or what we call orphan diseases, where uh, policymakers, health systems, industry partners uh, marginalize uh, inadvertently or advertently marginalized patients with rare disorders, but then COVID-19 only adds another layer of marginalization and uh, a disadvantage. So not only are hospitals taken away from patients or rather they are um, taken over by health services for uh, quarantining patients or for conducting tests, but Doctors themselves, specialists who rare disease patients regularly go to in certain countries are no longer available. In countries like India, as well as across the region, I was startled to see the number of patients who were stuck uh, at the imposition of lockdowns in areas or in, in homes or places where they don't normally live. So they had no access to the supplies their own inventory of supplies or to the regular pharmacists or uh, community organizations that they may have turned to. So um, the isolation, the lack of uh, um, transport, the uh, complete lockdown situations ensured that patients were hugely disadvantaged. At the same time, uh, in Philippines, for example, we find that home infusion protocols for certain conditions are not available because patients need to go to hospitals for certain infusions. And patient organizations were struggling to find home infusion protocols from industry partners. However, at the same time, there was a lot of heartening um, stories of how industry partners, patient organizations, healthcare professionals, pharmacists um, came together to find these levels of support. We have some touching stories of how these protocols were made available through the input and collaboration of multiple partners across the region. So yes, there are a lot of uh, uh, stories of grief and suffering, and yet in the world of rare diseases, there's also rays of light and hope. 
So I'd like to share with you very briefly, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I'd like to share with you um, a, a little report on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on organizations across Asia Pacific. And uh, are you able to see my screen, Arjit? Yes, 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 okay. it's clear. Uh, thank you. So we did find that uh, along the lines of what Anjali and Prue were sharing, that uh, there was a huge interruption of uh, services and supply chains, um, which had a catastrophic impact on patients who rely on these. Seven out of 10 organizations we found had faced decreased funding because um, the usual sources of funding, charity uh, drives, fundraisers, um, activities, social and community activities that led to, that generate, often generate the only source of funding for rare disease patients were taken away. And um, organizations struggled to support patients and uh, many organizations in the Asia Pacific specifically who are either um, disadvantaged from a lack of access to digital tools like computers, um, were not able to support their patients as efficiently, whereas organizations which had access to uh, digital tools found themselves very nimbly and quickly moving to digital platforms to provide this support. So this was uh, quite an interesting finding that um, um, digital platforms become so critical in supporting rare disease patients. Uh, we also find that um, uh, other than reduced funding and uh, interrupted supplies, we found that uh, a lot of organizations, and I'd like to highlight that while on my screen, you'll see only five out of 10 organizations uh, indicated enhanced uh, need for psychological health support. This data is really very old uh, because it was collected in April and May. And increasingly, we find that this number is shockingly increasing because not only do uh, patients require more mental health or psychological health support, but also caregivers who are now uh, trapped on almost, uh, please excuse that word, but that is uh, the sensation and the sentiment we are receiving is that parents, uh, parents and caregivers are trapped in the, um, in the home and uh, become the sole caregivers. In most countries, we don't have social support systems to support caregivers, but even in countries where some of this might be available, like community nursing or uh, social support that uh, um, old age homes or uh, disability centers where um, patients could go to are no longer available for these patients. And ca the caregiving burden increased to a point where a lot of patient, or, um, patient organizations highlight that mental health support becomes extremely critical. So uh, these were the brief highlights. I'm going to, uh, I won't uh, take you through all of them, but um, what I'd, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, while we do find these challenges that are common across the communities, um, lack of access to protective uh, personal and protective uh, gear or hand sanitizers, medication, etc. We also find that rare disease organizations are um, have set, have uh, a little to give, not just um, ask. And that is, my, in my experience, rare disease organizations, by the very nature of being marginalized and orphaned by the health systems, have learned to adapt to be uh, to survive in a rather barren health ecosystem where support is so limited. And we find that um, the agility, the responsiveness, the adaptability of rare disease organizations is a huge um, um, plus a benefit, uh, advantage that we can actually use to impart our experience and our ideas to all health organizations, not just rare, to all patient organizations. So mm -hmm. responding through telehealth, responding through um, delivery of medicines and supplies, finding innovative ways of raising funds and support for patient organizations, um, provide, bringing various stakeholders together to find creative solutions for patients. These are all aspects of rare disease uh, support services that I find lends hope and um, gives me some hope for the future. 
as we continue in our work, regardless of circumstances of pandemic or otherwise. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ritu. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Yes, we still have some time left for question and answer. So uh, can I start uh, some question to Mentally first? Mentally, you are here? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I would like to have, uh, there are some questions to you also, uh, and also my questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you said the community pharmacy uh, or pharmacist has a, another role for administer the COVID-19 vaccine that is interesting. Uh, so uh, you can explain a little bit more about the procedure and uh, is this a collaboration with the government or not? Uh, that is one question. And also uh, some, okay. uh, some, sorry. Uh, uh, Orijit, I think we will be running out. We'll just take one question uh, and then we have to end this okay. session. Thank you. So so uh, can two, two more questions to... Uh, through to the to prove right for about the exploitation uh, for Thai in Thailand we have health uh, village health volunteer and uh, caregiver so uh, is it in also include in that role and the third question to Dr Ritu that uh, the is it possible that uh, if you have some network with the radicis organization in yeah. Thailand and exchange experience so they are all uh, the three questions. Can I, can we have time for answer, Kabadip? Uh, no, we'll have to reply to everybody later on, but uh, please do wait for that. Uh, uh, please, we'll email everybody that, but do keep these questions in okay. mind. We will do it by email. Um, okay. We'd like to thank oh, everybody here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, we, it's such an interesting session. I think you yes. and I, <laughs> yes. I kind of lost yes. sense it's of time. So I just got reminded by the production, but uh, Thank you, everybody, for such a great session. I think it was a great um, insight. Thank you. Was happening. And thank you, everyone, and Kawadi. Thank you. So you. maybe we have another chance to talk later. Bye bye, everyone. And join thank us you. for the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.